Hi, my name is Brendan O'Connor, and this is Threat Modeling SaaS Applications, Anatomy of a Data Breach. So a little bit about me. I am the CEO and co-founder at AppOmni. Prior to founding AppOmni, I was a security practitioner for 20 years. Uh, right before I founded AppOmni, I was the security CTO at ServiceNow. And before joining ServiceNow, I was at Salesforce for 10 years, uh, about half of that time as the chief security officer. So I have the unique experience of having led security teams at the top two SaaS providers. And in addition to protecting the production infrastructure of these SaaS environments and delivering a secure service to our customers, I also had to manage a, a large internal global enterprise that was SaaS first. These were cloud companies and all internal IT systems were cloud first. So I, I had the challenge of having to manage enterprise security for SaaS at scale, not just delivering it to our customers, but protecting our internal users. And I'm gonna talk about SaaS today because the SaaS era is here. As a surprise to probably no one that's been paying attention, SaaS has kind of taken over the enterprise. This year, Gartner says that 95% of all new application software purchases are gonna be in the cloud. And that's really not that surprising. No one's really making on-premise software anymore. All the companies that are building SaaS versions of their existing software and all new software companies are SaaS first. But also 99% of cloud security failures continue to be the customer's fault. How can something that is so popular and so prevalent, we get it wrong, so wrong, so consistently? We're gonna talk about why that is. Because early on, if we go 13, 14 years ago, SaaS applications were simple web apps and they were accessed primarily through the enterprise network. People sitting at their workstations or laptops inside the network. And so CASBs were developed to broker access to the cloud. That's what CASB stands for, Cloud Access Security Broker. It's a broker, it stands between your network and the SaaS environment. But in the past 14 years, SaaS applications have grown. They have grown into complex platforms with an unlimited number of access points. So today we're gonna to talk about three data breaches through these new access points into the cloud. Number one is a customer support portal. Number two is gonna be third-party application breach. And number three, anonymous API access. Every single one of these is recent within the past you know, few months. And every one of these is based on real data. I've got in some cases edited screenshots uh, of real data that's been blacked out. And in other cases, we put in example slides. Um, I, I've been a CISO, I've been a security practitioner. I don't like to name and shame people that have had security breaches. Security is really hard. And in the community, we shouldn't be tearing each other down. We should be helping each other do better. So uh, I'm sure many of you can determine who some of these companies are, but we're not gonna name and shame anyone today. We're gonna talk about the underlying architectural and technical issues, uh, not who's to blame for these data breaches. All right, so let's get started. Here in case number one, we have a customer support portal. This is a very basic and very common piece of functionality. We have a support portal that's exposed to the internet with a knowledge base. So users, customers can search and they can come across our knowledge base. They can find answers to frequently asked questions and get support. Now, if they wanna log a support ticket or schedule a service appointment, they need to register. So users on the internet can sign up and get a unique username and password. From there, they can log into the support portal and log cases, they can schedule service appointments, they can see the status of their returns. Basic functionality that probably every one of you has, has used before. Now behind this portal is a SaaS platform. It's a SaaS support application. So we have database tables inside the SaaS platform and access control in this case has been set on the database tables. So only uh, support related information like the case table is being exposed through this portal to the outside world. Support agents, which are employees, they have full access but our customers, these external users, were limiting their access to only necessary database tables for the support portal. And we've also limited their privileges. So now when we're logged in and we look at the support portal, we see right here a little area of the screen where we've got a few links to our recent support cases. And if we click on one of these links, it's gonna take us to the support ticket and we can request a return, we can schedule our service appointment and do normal customer support type functionality. But if we do a view source and we look at the HTML, how is that little widget being populated with those recent cases? Well, underneath the hood, there's some JavaScript running and it's querying an API to go fetch that case data. 
and it's querying based on the case ID. So if we look at this response, we either look at the HTML or we run it through a proxy and we record what that request is, we can actually automate and replay this API query. So in this case, the attacker looked at one of their support cases, 100682, and what they did is they scripted an API query to start incrementing through those IDs, 683, 684, 685. They found out they were able to see support tickets belonging to other customers. Now, that's not great, but that's not terrible. It was pretty basic data around title of the support ticket, description, you know, what its priority has it been escalated. So not the end of the world. But there's something else that was interesting coming back in this response. When they query the API, they were getting a new parameter that they didn't know about, portal user ID. So they hit that API again, but instead of querying for cases, they queried for users and they passed in their portal user ID and found that they could pull back their own user record. And so by using the exact same attack of scripting through and, and incrementing through those queries, they were able to look at user 502346, 2347, 2348. And the end result was they could pull back not only case and support data, but user information on any other user in the system. So all customers had the same access profile, but they were set up such that any customer could see any other customer's data. So what the outside world should have seen is a very small slice of the SaaS application. They intentionally scoped out the support portal and only published very specific data tables to be accessible. But what the outside world did see was all data belonging to other customers inside this support portal. They saw over 100,000 attachments belonging to other customers. Some of these were debug logs and screenshots. Some of this was very sensitive information that customers had uploaded to their support case. They saw email messages belonging to different users. We've all gotten automated email replies for a customer support experience. And when you reply to that email, a lot of times it's routed back into the SaaS application. And in this case, it got sent into the SaaS support application and that email got added and updated to the user's support ticket. Uh, I've blocked out some information here that would maybe help you understand who this customer was. Like I said, I'm not going to name and shame anyone, but they saw 49,348 other users. So there was about 50,000 users in the support portal, and every one of them could see every other support portal user's data. And then they could see a lot of data that they should have seen. They could see how-tos and FAQs. They could see patch notes. They could see company news. So they could see the information that was intended for them, but they could see a whole lot of information that they shouldn't have seen. So there were some things that were set up correctly here. Um, only a small part of the SaaS application was exposed through the support, support portal. That's a best practice. A dedicated role was created for these external support users. They didn't reuse an internal profile. They created a dedicated role for the outside world. That's a best practice as well. And external users weren't able to get anywhere else in that SaaS application beyond the scope of the support portal. But what went wrong was the administrators of this portal confused UI visibility with access control. Because they couldn't see that information on the page, they had the mistaken assumption that users didn't have access to that data because they didn't see it in the UI, but they had access to it via the API. And there was no security change management process. So as this portal was getting built and rolled out, the security team had no idea what was happening. And even if they did, in this particular case, the security team totally lacked expertise on the access control and sharing models of this SaaS platform. While they properly restricted the database tables, they didn't set up rules for record-based sharing. So these outside users couldn't see data tables they shouldn't, but they didn't have the right row level sharing for different users, making sure they could only see their data. So the result was any support user can see every other user's data. What they needed were config standards on how to properly harden this portal and application. They needed an access control review by the security team for these external users. And they needed visibility and drift detection to configuration changes, changes to security settings, data access rules, and user-based permissions. They didn't have any of that. So App Omni has performed over 100 enterprise risk assessments. 
large customers, 80% of our customers are public companies. So we're not talking about small companies here, companies with large security teams. And we find in 95% of cases, external users are massively over-provisioned. This is one of the most prevalent problems in SaaS. All right, case number two, third-party applications. You may know who this is. Again, we're not going to name and shame anyone here, but uh, many of you have probably heard of this attack. So we're going to start with SaaS Authentication 101. There's three core ways that users log into a SaaS application. There's the old username and password. You sign in your username and password, and the SaaS application gives you a session ID. More and more, we're seeing strong identity, you know, zero trust with identity providers and single sign-on. I highly recommend this approach. This is uh, technologies like Ping Identity or Okta. Many of you probably are using one of those tools. So you have an, a user that connects to the identity provider using strong authentication. And from there, once authenticated, they can click on a tile or a link from that IDP and get routed and logged into their SaaS application using single sign-on. And there's actually a third model too, where SaaS applications can be configured to always redirect authentication back to the IDP. So if a user tries to log in directly the insecure way with a normal username and password, the SaaS application is gonna redirect them to that IDP. They get strong authentication from their identity provider and then they're logged in. In all three of those flows, the end result is a session ID. Once you have the session ID, you just interact with the SaaS application. As you click around and go from page to page, you don't have to log in again. You have the session. So it's kind of like going to a, a concert or, or venue or a bar where you have to show your ID and then they give you like a wristband or a handstand. So you have strong authentication at the front door, but once you're inside, you have this kind of local authentication credential. That's your wristband. And that's what your browser is automatically showing the SaaS application as you use it, your session ID. So once that session is established, once I have my wristband, the identity provider is not part of the equation anymore. Its job is to give me the wristband. So now I'm just talking directly to the SaaS application. Well, let's say I wanna use another app that's online. Now, this app could be anything. It could be the email app on my phone. It could be a major application like marketing automation, business ETL or e-signature. Or it could be a small application that's a, a browser plugin or a new app that a startup is pushing out and they offer free trials and a user wants to use it. Well, when they go to connect that application into your SaaS platform, it's using a technology called OAuth. So with the OAuth protocol, the app is asking our SaaS application, I would like a token so that I can connect to you. And the SaaS application then presents to the user, hey, app number two is requesting to connect and it's requesting these permissions. And so the user gets a little dialogue box and they can choose to accept or deny. And if they click accept, the SaaS application issues an authentication token, an OAuth token to app number two. So app two has its own wristband. The IDP provider was not involved in this transaction at all. Remember the users already authenticated to SaaS and now they are making a copy of their wristband or a subset of their permissions and they're handing it to app number two. And so now app number two, whenever it calls into the SaaS platform, it shows its wristband, its OAuth token. That's how that communication occurs. But OAuth tokens are a special kind of wristband. They don't expire. They're good until revoked. This is how applications talk to each other in the modern world. When you're using the email app on your phone, whether you're at the office using the enterprise network, you're using your Wi-Fi at home, or you're out and about using the public carrier network, T-Mobile, AT&T, Verizon, you don't have to log in again. You just open your app and it's syncing your email in the background. It has an OAuth token. It's talking directly to that online exchange or Gmail server. We've all seen this in the personal world with login with Facebook, login with Google. That's OAuth underneath the hood. In SaaS applications, they use OAuth too. That's how these APIs talk to each other. That's how these applications integrate. OAuth is everywhere. And so third party applications can be the weak link. In the case of this breach, app two was compromised. The SaaS cloud was, com was not compromised. The users were not compromised. It was the environment of app two. There was no phishing attack in this particular case. This is app two gets compromised by a third party. And from there, the attacker had access to all of the OAuth tokens. 
So these were OAuth tokens for many different users and customers across many different SaaS environments. So the actor, the bad actor was able to connect directly into the SaaS environment using a valid OAuth token that had already been granted. So certain things were set up correctly in this architecture. There was strong authentication using an identity provider. SecOps was monitoring that IDP's authentication logs. They were looking for suspicious login activity. And the SaaS application was set up with IP restrictions, login hours for users, and short session timeouts. But OAuth doesn't go through IP restrictions, login hours, or session timeouts. Remember, these apps run in the background. They have their own wristband. They talk directly to the cloud. So what went wrong was there was an incorrect assumption that because they had an IDP, it must be involved in all authentication-related transactions. It's not true. The security team was not scanning their SaaS environment, looking at third-party applications, and they had no visibility into OAuth tokens being issued or how often they were being used or who was using them. So what they needed was a real-time inventory of connected apps in their SaaS environment. They didn't even know all the applications that were in there. They didn't have an approval process or workflow for looking at and governing third-party apps before they got connected or kicking ones that shouldn't be in there out of their ecosystem. And the SaaS event logs were not integrated into SecOps. So SecOps had visibility into the network. They had visibility into Active Directory and their IDP. They didn't have their SaaS logs as part of that. So they didn't see a very key part of the attack here. Had they had that deeper integration, they would have been able to see this activity. We find on average, there are 42 third-party apps connected into customer SaaS environments. Of those, less than half of them have received a security review or the security team doesn't even know about them. This is incredibly common. If you inventory your major SaaS platforms today, I guarantee you're gonna be surprised about some of the third-party apps that are in there authorized today. Okay, breach number three, anonymous API access. So in this example, we are hosting an event. We're hosting a virtual wine tasting. You go to a, a marketing form that we've set up. We send this invitation out to our customers. They go to this marketing form and they enter their first name, their last name, their email address, and their mailing address. We ship them a bottle of wine and send them a calendar invite and they get to attend this virtual wine tasting. So this form is powered by a marketing SaaS application. So this is a SaaS application that's hosting this marketing form and is used by the marketing team. And on the back end, it's connected to that company's CRM, but it's connected with write only access. So as people sign up for this web form, the marketing SaaS application collects these leads, it does its thing and then writes them to the company's CRM. Very typical use case. So what's happening under the hood, if we look at the HTML on this form, we see there's a post request, it's posting to this marketing SaaS API, and it's got very basic information, email address, first name, last name, mailing address. But there's a couple of functional problems. Number one, duplicate accounts are getting created in the CRM. When Brendan goes to sign up, well, guess what? Brendan's already a customer that's inside that CRM database. But the marketing SaaS application didn't know that, so it went and created another Brandon. And if I go back and sign up a week later, well, guess what? I get a new calendar invite and a second bottle of wine. Not a bad day. But there's another functional problem. In addition to creating duplicates, whenever a new lead is created, it's getting routed to low-level sales reps to start cold calling. Well, that's a problem because my sales rep is Dan, and I'm already a customer. And Dan's going to get upset that I'm getting bothered with cold calls from a low-level sales rep when we're trying to work on a big enterprise deal. So sales went to marketing and said, listen, if the account already exists or that lead's already assigned to someone, don't assign it to another rep. Don't go bother my customer. You send that to me. That's my client. Very basic use cases. This is nothing surprising here. So to fix this, they grant read access to the marketing SaaS application. So now it can read the company's CRM and it's gonna do two things. It's first gonna check, does Brendan exist? And if he exists, don't go create a new Brendan record, just mark that he's gonna go. Mark him as attending equals true. Second, if he's already assigned to a customer account or, or a sales rep, don't go bother him with by sending the lead to, to get cold called or to a low level rep. Make sure that you just notify the existing account manager. But in doing this, in solving these very valid functional problems, a massive data leak was created. 
When we look at this marketing form, it was write only, but its APIs support the read method as well. But when the security team looked at it, there was nothing that was returned on any of the read methods. It wasn't connected to anything. It had no read access. So you could query its APIs all day long and you weren't getting anything. The second that read permission was granted to the company CRM, all those APIs woke up. They were always there. They just had no data behind them. So suddenly this one change in permissions now I can start to query these public APIs. Now I can query with my email address and I get back my own record, my email, my first name, my last name, my company. But we learned a new piece of information here, company ID. I didn't know what my company ID was before, but now that I can query this API, it's getting returned to me. Company ID, this is how we're determining is a sales rep already assigned to this account or not. That was part of our functional use case. Now I have a new piece of information. So I look at this marketing SaaS clouds documentation, which is public. All these APIs are well-documented. They're not a secret. And I do a company query. So now I'm going to query by company ID. And guess what? I get back more contacts, my coworkers, other people that are in my company that are going to this virtual wine tasting. But just like we saw in previous attacks, we can script this and it's easier because it's not authenticated. We can just blindly script queries to it and iterate through company IDs. And by doing this, the attacker was able to dump the entire company CRM by scripting, incrementing through company IDs and pulling back the responses from the API. They were able to exfiltrate all of the data. So a couple of things were set up correctly in this example. We had an authenticated service account on the back end connecting our marketing SaaS environment to our company CRM, two separate systems. And our initial architecture was secure. It was one way. This was a write only operation. But what went wrong was when we granted read access to the marketing SaaS application, there was a huge downstream impact and not one that the CRM administrator could have anticipated. They were asked to grant read access to an authorized service account. And there was no monitoring of critical security controls. The thing that made that architecture secure was the one-way right nature of it. The second it stopped being one-way, the second it stopped being right only, we had a major architecture change. That control had failed, but no one looked at it. What was needed was continuous controls monitoring, actually going out and making sure, are the controls we expect in place? And if they're not, tell me about it. And there was also no security baseline for configure access control. Had they been monitoring permissions to a baseline, they would have seen that a service account just got its privilege level upped in the production environment. That's what caused this issue. So we see in 55% of cases, sensitive data is exposed from a customer SaaS application to the public internet. I did not misspeak, I'm gonna say that again. 55% of the time, more than half the time, we find sensitive data exposed to the public internet without the need for authentication. No phishing attack, no dropping a malware payload on someone's laptop, no credential stuffing. The data is out there just waiting to be taken. It is way more prevalent than you think. Okay, so recap. Three breaches, the customer support portal, third-party applications via OAuth, and anonymous API access. I only got 20 minutes. I could talk for 20 days if you let me and talk through some of the breaches and different attack vectors, but I picked three that were all very recent. So conclusions, what do we do about this? Number one, we have a huge double standard in security. When it comes to more classic web app development, we have all kinds of tools that we give to our security team. We give them code analysis tools, vulnerability scanners, security guidelines and best practices for locking down applications and hardening, web application firewalls, and even runtime protection, watching our workloads in the cloud. But when it comes to SaaS, we just cross our fingers and hope for the best. We don't have the same level of tools. We're, these are some of the most sensitive applications with some of the most sensitive data in the environment for the enterprise, and we're, we don't empower our security teams to properly scan, secure, and monitor these applications. So what should you do? How can we do this better? Number one, you gotta embrace the shared responsibility model. People understand shared responsibility as it applies to infrastructure, but they tend not to get it when it applies to SaaS. You get a ton of security for free from SaaS. I think SaaS is just a better way to do enterprise software and there's a lot you get for free. Cloud providers spend a lot of time on security, but it's not magic. 
you still own data governance. You still own access control. You still own integrations, third-party apps that get connected in and the privilege levels and configuration of all the security settings. That's always been your job. But we don't have ownership of SaaS security in most security teams. This tends to be no one's job. And because it's not anyone's job specifically, 99% of breaches in the cloud are the customer's fault because it's not anyone's job to be looking or taking care of these things. This needs to be a first class citizen in your application security program. SaaS applications are among the most important with some of the most sensitive data in the enterprise, but there is not clearly defined ownership within security. And also you need to recognize the limited scope of tools like CASBs because while CASBs can give you value for certain use cases, again, they're not magic. You're not gonna know what's going on in your cloud applications or who's accessing your data in the cloud by looking at your network. The data is not on your network. The application's not on your network. You can't build a wall around the cloud. The cloud is public, it's on the internet. And if you're not looking at your data controls in your application configuration, you are missing a lot of the attack surface and the way people are getting breached. And that's point number four, take a proactive approach. Don't wait to get breached. So how you can protect your SaaS data, secure the data, not just your perimeter. We can't take on-premise pegs and try and fit them into a cloud-shaped hole. It's a different sort of technology. It requires a different solution. You need to be looking at your applications and data in the cloud. You need to gain visibility into who has access to your data today. I will guarantee you, if you go and you look at your production SaaS environments and all of the users and applications and APIs and service accounts that are in there today, you're gonna to be surprised. There's gonna be a lot of people that you didn't know had access or programs that you didn't know have access in your environments today. Number three, implement guardrails. In every one of these breaches, we did not have a malicious insider. No one was trying to harm the company or put customers at risk. It's good people with good intentions just trying to do their job, but we're not giving them a net. And so with the cloud, you can shoot yourself in the foot with a cannon. The blast radius for some of these mistakes on config and data access can be huge. We need to put guardrails in place for our users to help keep them from crashing the car. And number four, continuously monitor your SaaS environment. This is not a one-time thing. It's not a once a year or once a quarter thing. Users, whole areas of your business live inside SaaS applications, whether it's email, document collaboration, chat and messaging, sales automation, marketing automation, customer service and support, code, DevOps. SaaS is everywhere. You need to be continuously monitoring your SaaS environments, starting with your most important mission critical apps that have the most sensitive data. Okay, thank you guys so much. Uh, I know I covered a lot, but if you'd like to learn more, you can find us at appomni.com or you can reach out to Dan Devane. He's your regional sales rep. He's my sales rep. Dan's a great guy. Thanks so much. I don't know how to stop the recording. Oh, there we go.